کرد Okay, so uh, everyone wants to know about note cards. So if you weren't here on Monday, you didn't get a note card, you got to pick it up from me. And if you have to pick it up from me, you have to come to my office. And if you come to my office, you have to catch me before I leave today because I'm getting ready to catch a flight. So I will be leaving probably by about 3 or 3.30. So if you wait too long, you're not going to get that note card. I'll remind everybody that the note card is required for the exam. Even if you don't want to use it, you have to have a note card that you get from me to bring to the exam. So make sure you get a note card from me, otherwise you're going to lose significant points. Yes? You should, yeah, should you put your name on the note card? The answer is yes. Okay. So make sure that you have a note card. And the note card has to have 100% your own handwriting. You can't use photocopied things. Okay. All right. Can't use photocopied things. Can't cut and paste figures. You can't put layers. It's all going to be handwritten. Everything on the note card must be handwritten. Yes. You can use both sides. You can use the edge if you can write that small. And I've seen people who literally can write that small. I always marvel when I look at these. They're really remarkable. Some of them are works of art that people put together with these things. And no, I, I totally admire that. I think it's very cool. Um, because what you learn in putting together the note cards, what you learn is organization. And you want to use that space efficiently. And what you're really doing is you're organizing your own brain. It really works. That's why I like to get students thinking about using note cards uh, as, as study tools, not to bring it to use in class, but to think about that for using it as a study tool. That might be useful for you when you think about next term. Yes? Uh, so the final in this OK. So the final is in this room on Wednesday of finals week at 6 PM. Not my favorite time to give a final. Um, probably not your favorite time to take a final, but that's the time that they gave us. So Wednesday at 6 PM. I will have a review session. I get back into town on Wednesday afternoon. And I'm planning a review session on Wednesday evening at 7 PM. Tuesday, what did I say? Wednesday wouldn't be good. <laughs> Why not? We can review during the exam, right? You guys probably wouldn't, like, wouldn't mind that, I imagine. All right, so Tuesday at 7 PM in ALS 4001. I will videotape that uh, review session as I've done the others. Okay, And um, that's basically it. So don't forget, you need the note card from me, even if you're not going to use it. You have to have that at the exam. And second of all, you need to um, have that note card completely handwritten. Okay? Yes? Is the exam is the same format as the others? Yes, it is. The exam will not be quite twice as long. OK? So it'll typically be about 180 points, maybe 150 points. I haven't decided. But um, it'll be, still be 45% of your overall grade. So that's what the final exam is. It's 45% of your grade, regardless of how many points it actually is. And um, the coverage on the exam will be roughly proportional to what you saw in the class. OK? So that means new material will be roughly 25 to 30% of the exam. That is new material since the last exam. The other, rest of the exam will be basically about a split between the other two in terms of points uh, coming from each. You won't see the same questions, other than maybe one or two. I might just use the same question. But you will see uh, similar things. In terms of studying, I think it's helpful for you to actually look at your old, the exams I've given you this term um, as, again, sort of an outline. All right? so, uh, I'm not going to go in and ask obscure things that we haven't talked about before and that sort of thing. I don't do that. Um, but you will see cover similar coverage of topics and so forth that you've had on the two exams that you've had from me already. Okay? The uh, exams are uh, keys are posted on the bulletin board outside of my office. And exam one is posted underneath of exam two. So you, if you need to see exam one, you, you can see that there as well. I haven't finished. I'm still working on regrades of the exams. I will leave them in the BB office before I leave. Um, so you'll have those available to you in there. Okay. Um, 
And anything else? Yes. Well, I'll be, I'll be in my office, yeah. So anytime I'm in my office, that's office hours. So yes, I'll be in my office right directly after class today. Okay? Um, and if you didn't get a note card today, you can still pick one up Tuesday, but that would mean you don't have much time to mess with filling it out and that sort of thing. So um, whatever works for you. But the main thing is that you have a note card before you come to class on the final exam. I will not bring note cards to the final exam. People have asked me if I would do that, and I said, no. <laughs> It's up to you to make sure you do that before you come to the exam. Okay? There's a reason I do that. I don't do it to be mean. Um, I do it to ensure that people are, uh, in fact, using the right uh, thing and that they, they're turning it back into me. When you turn the note card in, you will not get to keep it. Okay? You'll turn it in with the final exam. And the reason I do that is because I want you to have the benefit of making that note card. If you had a roommate who took the exam, took my course last year, and they hand you their note card, that's not the same benefit you're going to have as if you make that note card yourself. So by enforcing that you're turning in that note card to me, I'm making sure that your roommate next year is going to have to fill out their own note card and learn in the process of doing that. So there's really a benefit in, in filling these out. And I want to make sure people realize that, and they're just not just passing cards to each other. If you want a copy of your card, absolutely make a photocopy of it. I don't have a problem with that. But again, they're still going to have to turn, get their card from me. That's, that's why that, that all works that way. Does that make sense? Yes? Can we bring a magnifying glass? Can you bring a magnifying glass? <laughs> you can bring it, but you can't use it. How's that? <laughs> so um, I actually had a student one year who decided that, I may have told this story, I don't know, but he, he decided that he, if he used different colored glasses, he could completely write one thing in red and completely write over it in green and then by looking at the red or the green, he actually had, the, the, in essence, two note cards in front of him. And I said, I don't think that'll work. And he did it, and it worked. <laughs> so I stopped letting people use external things uh, for the uh, exam. So, so you know, you can't use a, a magnifying glass. You should be writing as big as you can read. If you're writing smaller than you can read, then, yeah, then you're in trouble. Uh, one of my songs is about a note card that, that, that you, you have to use a font size of, 0.014 in order to uh, read it. So um, we'll probably sing that next term, I guess. Okay, well, we're almost done. Now, we have um, a, a couple of very cool surprises today. Uh, I always like to finish on a very high note. Ha ha, that's a joke. Um, and uh, we have a couple, and not one, but we actually have two very cool surprises at the end of what I'll have to say today. So I hope that you'll all hang around for that and uh, join in because it's going to be a lot of fun. All right, but we have some business to do before then, and the business we have to do is we have to finish up glycogen metabolism. I've been very pleased. I've had a number of interactions with some of you outside class say, wow, this complexity is really cool. This is really interesting how these things are connected, and I, I actually have that sentiment myself. I think it's, these are really fascinating things. They're complicated, okay? Um, but the intricate ways in which they work together to ensure that our cells uh, and our body are all pulling the oars in the same direction, really is remarkable. You'll see this continuing in um, the first half of the term, next uh, term, when we continue metabolism, talking about the citric acid cycle, fatty acid metabolism, uh, lipid metabolism, and uh, nucleotide metabolism. And this uh, interconnectedness that we see between pathways continues through that. And so by the end of metabolism, I hope you have a really good idea about how your body um, is actually working. Okay. Well, last time um, I got to this figure, and I talked about how it was that phosphoprotein phosphatase is regulated. Okay? So phosphoprotein phosphatase is uh, the PP1 that we see here. And PP1, as I noted, was most active when it was bound to this protein called GM, M standing for muscle. There's also a GL that stands for liver. Uh, when it's bound to that protein and it's not bound to something else, this guy is maximally active. All right? So this really helps facilitate the activity of the PP1, the GM protein does. All right? Now, I noted that when we um, get glucagon or epinephrine stimulation, we activate protein kinase A. And protein kinase A, as you've already seen, does many things. But one of the things that protein kinase A is doing is it's phosphorylating GM. 
The phosphorylation of GM causes GM to let go of phosphoprotein phosphatase. That leaves the phosphoprotein phosphatase in a less active form. And there is an inhibitor of phosphoprotein phosphatase that we're just calling inhibitor. And the inhibitor also can be phosphorylated by the um, uh, protein kinase A. And the phosphorylation of the inhibitor causes it to bind to PP1 and completely shut off PP1. So again, this kinase cascade that's stimulated by epinephrine is totally directed towards the breakdown of glycogen. Totally directed towards that. And it's totally directed towards inhibiting the synthesis of glycogen. So you saw the breakdown and the, the activation of uh, or the conversion of uh, glycogen phosphorylase B into A. You saw the turning off of glycogen synthase. And now you're seeing the turning off of the phosphatase so that um, all, of the, all, all of the things that would, would reverse the cycle are all turned off as well. So now the cycle is going to break down um, uh, glycogen. OK, so questions on this? All right, well, there's still more interesting things about the glycogen breakdown uh, pathway. All right. Now I'm going to show you a figure here that your book uses, and I think students find it a little bit uh, confusing. So don't get too hung up on this figure. Uh, so I'm partly showing you this figure to tell you not to sweat it too much. All right. Um, I'm showing it to you to show you, again, some complexity. But I will tell you up front, I'm not going to require you to know something on this figure. Okay? So you can sit and relax for a minute. All right? I've been telling you that insulin stimulation reverses the pathway of the epinephrine and glucagon. Okay? And this makes sense because glucagon and epinephrine are, are aimed at producing glucose for the body when it needs it. Insulin is released when the body has too much glucose and needs to deal with it. So they're opposite needs, opposite situations. The insulin receptor, as you can see here, uh, and as you recall from the last exam, goes through a series of steps activating uh, a variety of things. And some of those are protein kinases. The protein kinases that can be activated by the insulin uh, pathway ultimately convert glycogen synthase, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Glycogen synthase ultimately is converted into an active state. Now, the confusing thing in here is they have an enzyme they call glycogen synthase kinase. All right? We talked about protein kinase A. Right? Protein kinase A, we said phosphorylated glycogen synthase. Here's another kinase they're throwing into the mix. And that kinase is getting inactivated. So insulin stimulation is stopping the phosphorylation of glycogen synthase. And you may recall that phosphorylation of glycogen synthase caused it to be inactive. So insulin is stopping the inactivation of glycogen synthase. If that's confusing, don't sweat it. I'm just telling you this so you have this basic knowledge about it. Okay. Meanwhile, PP1, phosphoprotein phosphatase, takes phosphates off. It's taking phosphate off of glycogen synthase and converting glycogen synthase from the inactive state to the active state. How does PP1 get activated? That's a much more complicated problem we're not going to address. OK, questions about that? Yeah? I'm sorry? Her question is, does it deactivate it and then reactivate it? No, this is, a, this is a different enzyme than this is. This is a kinase. This is glycogen synthase. So in other words, it's inactivating a kinase. So the kinase can't put a phosphate onto the synthase. And therefore, PP1 can take the phosphate off and it stays off. That's why I say it's a confusing figure. Okay. But the glycogen synthase is not the same as the glycogen synthase kinase. A glycogen synthase kinase, as its name says, a kinase puts a phosphate onto something. So a glycogen synthase kinase puts a phosphate onto glycogen synthase. OK. Well, there um, is, as we always look deeper and deeper into these things, there are always 
more interesting things that we can determine. And probably one of the most interesting ones that turns out to be in glycogen um, metabolism is actually the next figure, or the next two figures I'm going to show you. All right? It starts out with um, an odd observation. Okay? People say that the best scientific discoveries don't start out with, I've had this amazing idea. They, in they instead start out with, hmm, that's odd. All right? Well, this thing started out with this observation that this was odd. Okay? It started out with the observation that this was odd. They started with a mixture of glycogen phosphorylase in the A form and glycogen synthase in the B form. And this mixture, of course, you remember A is what we call the more active form of the phosphorylase, and the B form is the, more active, uh, the less active form of the synthase. Very simple thing. You put these together, and you ask the question, what happens? Well, if you put it together, basically, you're going to break down glycogen. You're not going to make it because the synthase is, is in the fairly inactive state. But then the curious thing was they added glucose. When they added glucose, something really weird happened. Glycogen phosphorylase A started disappearing and started to become glycogen phosphorylase B. And glycogen synthase went from the B form, which was inactive, to the active form, simply by the addition of glucose. There was nothing else that was in this tube except for some glycogen. Okay? So why did this happen? How did this happen? How did glucose cause these changes to happen in these enzymes? Okay? Well, what they discovered was kind of cool. Right? Oh, by the way, let me remind you of something here also. So let, let's go back here. So remember that glycogen phosphorylase A has a phosphate. To go to the B form, it's got to lose the phosphate. Glycogen synthase B has a phosphate, and to go to the A, it's got to lose a phosphate. This is not an allosteric change. This is a covalent modification. It's not going from R to T and T to R, because that takes an allosteric effector. We'll see that plays into this. But that's not the cause of what's going on here. There was something else that was going on in this experiment. The something else that was going on in this experiment is actually shown in the next figure. When they analyzed the glycogen phosphorylase A, they discovered that it really wasn't a glycogen phosphorylase A all by itself. It doesn't exist by itself all by itself in the cell for the most part. Instead, they discovered it was linked to a protein called GL. And you know GL is like GM. It binds to phosphoprotein phosphatase. This enzyme, which breaks down glycogen, was carrying around with it. People didn't even know it. It was carrying around with it an enzyme that will take phosphates off. And when you added glucose, what happens when you add glucose to glycogen phosphorylase A? Anybody remember that? It'll be on the exam. It converts glycogen phosphorylase A from the R state to the T state. That is an allosteric change. And that allosteric change causes the enzyme to let go of the phosphatase and GL. So this conversion, the adding of glucose, caused the enzyme to let go of this because the enzyme is converting from the R state to the T state. OK? There's glycogen phosphorylase T that's been in the T state that's been released. Well, not only was, the, was this enzyme released, but this enzyme was released. Over here, this enzyme, the phosphoprotein phosphatase, wasn't active. It was blocked by the phosphorylase. This guy is inactive. This guy over here is active as all get out. Really cool. What's happening is, it releases phosphoprotein phosphatase, which now takes phosphates off of everything. It takes the phosphate off of glycogen phosphorylase A and converts it into glycogen phosphorylase B. It takes the phosphate off of glycogen synthase B and turns it into glycogen synthase A. And it all happened because, hmm, something was odd. If I add glucose, why do these enzymes change? 
That was a clue. We needed to look at something a little more closely. Looking at it more closely revealed exactly what you see on the screen. Isn't that cool? I see some yeses. That's good. People are still awake. By the way, I just told you. <laughs> so his question is, how do we figure this? How do we know it was there? We knew it was there because we started looking because we had an odd observation. That's my point. My point is when you see something that's unexpected, you realize there has to be something more to the picture than what you thought was the picture. And when you start analyzing that, you think, hmm, I wonder why that would happen. Based on what you know from what I've told you, you know that the only way you're going to go from B to A is by taking, I'm sorry, from, from A to B in the case of the, of the phosphorylase or B to A in the case of the synthase is by taking a phosphate off. There's a pretty good clue right there. You had to be somehow activating a phosphatase. Well, they knew they didn't have a phosphatase there because they'd spent a lot of effort purifying this thing as best they could. So it's pretty cool, pretty darn cool. Questions about this? Everybody's stunned by that. Yes? So PP1 is what's taking the phosphate off. PP1 is what's the phosphate off. You got it. PP1's inactive over here. PP1's active over here. Could you go over it just one more time? Go over it one more time. OK. You've got glycogen phosphorylase in the A form is bound to this protein called GL, which is bound to phosphoprotein phosphatase. This complex blocks the active site of the phosphoprotein phosphatase. So the phosphoprotein phosphatase is inactive. The glycogen phosphorylase is active. Addition of glucose causes the glycogen phosphorylase A, which is in the R state, the most active state, to convert to the T state. And the conversion to the T state causes a change in structure. That change in structure causes the GL and phosphoprotein phosphatase to be released. They're released in an, now in an active form. That active form of phosphoprotein phosphatase can start taking phosphates off of things. It takes phosphates off of glycogen phosphorylase A, converts it to glycogen phosphorylase B. It takes phosphates off of glycogen synthase B and converts it into glycogen synthase A. Thus, glycogen phosphorylase is left in a fairly inactive state. Glycogen synthase is left in a fairly active state. Pretty cool. Other questions? Are you guys ready for some surprises? All right. The first surprise we have is um, actually coming from one of the students in the class. And uh, David Shumway um, is a prolific songwriter. And he uh, and I have actually worked together on songs before. David uh, came up with a song that he's going to sing for you in a minute and that you're going to help him with. That was totally his own. I had nothing to do with it. I can't claim any credit for it. So I'd like to ask David to come up front and lead everybody in the singing of our first song. Yes, David. Would you like to say anything before we get started? Oh, uh, yeah, a little bit. Okay. You can get the mic there. Is that it? Is that attached to you? Oh, okay. It's not too attached to me. Go ahead. Oh. All right, there we go. Yeah, so this actually isn't the Don't hold it too close because you'll blow everybody out. All right. Sorry. Um, is that good? Yeah. Great. So this actually isn't the first class I've had with Kevin. Uh, last spring I took this um, little like colloquium thing called uh, to sing a song of science with him. Right. Honors and College. Yeah. It was, it was a lot of fun. There were like you know, eight, nine of us in the class and we just uh, met once a week to write silly songs. Um, and when I was in this class and studying for the second midterm, I uh, um, was having a little trouble with it, so I just started writing this song in my head and, and ended up helping me out quite a bit. So I really want to share it with you guys. It is uh, it's to the tune of Wrecking Ball, which um, <laughs> you should all know. Yeah. I really love that song, by the way. It's like uh, Lana Del Rey and Ellie Bowling had like a weird love child, like played with Olan for a little bit. And, like, uh, yeah. Yeah, so the words are up there. Um, so I want to hear you guys sing loud, and I'll try not to blow your ear off. I think I'll uh, probably put the mic down. Okay, and yeah. Loud, so. All right. All right. <clears throat> Go. Go. <laughs> 
go ahead. Oh, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. Just, just make sure everyone's poised. Born in the pancreas, made the protein smash and out. Still not knowing how. Dormant they wait until the day trips and cuts. Activating now. And teropeptidase starts a cascade, trips and cleaves all the rest. Chymotrypsin elastase, pancreatic lipase, now we're ready to digest. I came in like a protease, calling the hypothesis race, cleaving cytogen to activate the catalytic strength. Yeah, there, catalytic strength. There's a protease cascade when we're in pain. Fibrin clots up when we bleed. Prothrombin activates by enzyme 10 a fibrinogen into the form we need. Fibrin soft until transglutaminase fills the lattice with covalent bond. Prothrombin needs vitamin K, block it or use TPA. Now plasmin can break down clots. Yeah, it's all caused by a protease. Come on, guys. <laughs> Which we can use to medicate. Get O2 stroke victims' brains. What we learn could save a life. Yeah, we could save a life. Now I know why we study this stuff, even though it seems so rough. Now I know why we study this stuff. Yeah, we save a life. Awesome. Awesome. David is one of the best lyricists I know. The song that he's talking, the, the class he's talking about is, is called Sing a Song of Science. It's in the Honors College. And if you're interested in it, let me know. Uh, it's actually going to be offered this year in the spring term. So if you're interested in participating in that, that would be great. OK. Well, I said we had not, I'm going to ask David to stay here for a minute. Uh, we had not one surprise, but we had two surprises today. And so it's time for our second surprise. So our second surprise requires a little different introduction. No, I don't have the Beatles here for you today, as much as I would like to. Um, I really love the Beatles. I love the Beatles so much that, well, sometimes I, <laughs> I kind of put myself there, you know? Let it be before 50. Uh, the Beatles, of course, were, the, were my generation, and that was back in the 60s. They were succeeded by the Bee Gees, which probably nobody here even knows who they are, which, which came in the 70s. Bee Gees, OK. Uh, staying alive. And uh, they were succeeded by this really great group called the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> which was in turn succeeded, these are all bees you might notice, by the way, beetles, bee gees, and the biggest bee that's out there probably was, nobody laughs at that anymore. <laughs> but there's actually another bee that we all need to know, and they're known as the Biocomical Choir. This year, the Biocomical Choir, usually it's a group of people who come up and sing songs with me, but this year, not only do I have people who sing songs with me, but I have four members of the OSU Symphony Orchestra who are going to accompany. So please, everyone, come forward. Please give a applause. It's going to take us a minute to get set up. So if I can ask the orchestra folks to come up here, you guys get a very prominent place up here. I also want to invite my TA, Robbie, who I see sitting in the back, to come up and join us. Robbie, you want to come join us? All right. OK. So we're going to sing from our famous album known as other, anybody who wants to come up is also welcome as well. Um, we, we, get, we, get a, we get a mob. Oops, we're going to do it again. All right. Somebody can share their lyrics with Robbie here. We've got four tunes we're going to play. And uh, two of them you've heard before, two of them you haven't heard before. And the first one requires, uh, it's going to mention a name you've never heard before, Kenneth Lay. Anybody know who Kenneth Lay is? 
It was involved in a big scandal. So the first song is an old song, and it refers to him. So that's who it's referring to. He's called Kenneth Light. The first song is called God Rest Ye, Merry Dieters, and we'll ask our orchestra to get us started. So whenever you guys are ready. You guys sing loud, guys. Gee, merry dieters with high cholesterol. Their chylomicrons all contain triacoglycerols and move from lymph to capillaries where their progress stalls. Thanks, lipoprotein lipase, protein lipase. Oh, thank you, lipoprotein lipase. And after their fat goodies have been hydrolyzed away, the chylomicron remnants go along their merry way. The liver grabs them from the blood and puts them all away, just as we should do with Kenneth Lay. Kenneth Lay, oh, just as we should do with Kenneth Lay. And when the liver gets a message from the body cells, it makes up little packages we call the LDLs. They seem like chylomicrons, but turn into something else. Please, the LDLs, LDLs. Oh, please don't become the LDLs. For LDLs cause chaos when their insides oxidize. The macrophages bind to them and foam cells can arise. You'd better watch your diet or your blood flow will downsize. And that would not be very wise, very wise. No, that would not be very wise. So if you take some lessons from this little comic bit, your diet should be healthy and you should try to stay fit. You think that you're not trying not to overdo it, and your heart will never ever quit. Want to quit? Oh, Awesome. Okay, one down, another one to go. You guys have heard this one before. This is going to help us a lot to stay on tune. Let's go with Hark the Sucrose. You guys can start us. Carbohydrates all should sing. Glory to the Hayworth ring. Anomeric carbons high when they're in a glycoside. Glucopyranose is there in the boat or in the chair. Alpha, beta, D, and L, diastereomer hell. Alpha, beta, D, and L, diastereomer hell. Awesome. Okay, number three, which we won't have accompaniment for here, I think, so we'll have to see how well we can hold our tunes. Okay, I've got the wrong one here, don't I? Okay, so you guys have heard this one before. Everybody remembers this one? So this, this one, we sang it earlier in the term. Some of the things may not have made sense, but after today, some of the things at the end should make sense. So if they don't, they don't get extra credit. They, they're going to sing loud. They have been singing very loud. So, Oh, little protein molecule, you're lovely and serene. With 20 zwitter ions like cysteine and alanine, your secondary structure has pitches and repeats. 
arranged in alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. The Ramachandran plots are predictions made to try to tell the structures you can have for angles phi and psi and tertiary structure gives polypeptide zing because of magic that occurs in protein folding. A folded enzyme's active and starts to catalyze when activators bind into its allosteric sites. Some other mechanisms control the enzyme rates by regulating synthesis and placement of phosphates. And all the regulation that's found inside of cells reminds the students learning it of pathway straight from hell. So here's how to remember the phosphate strategies. They turn the GPBs to A's and GSAs to B's. All right. Okay. I've got to do a little whiz here. Let's see. Just hold on here. I forgot to pull this down earlier. A whiz. A quiz or a whiz? Yeah. Let's see. Let me get that. All right. All right, so this is a song you're probably not going to know the tune of. It's an old song, came out in the 60s, sung by Neil Diamond called Song Sung Blue. And it's um, a tune that I've never sung in front of a class before. Uh, so this is, the, you guys are getting a brand new one as well. It's called Ode to Bicarbonate. It's something that related to what we had earlier in the term. And I'd like to try to make that work. You guys can help with this. Ready? H2O ionizes slowly. You should know its behavior wholly. It presides in cells inside a solvent grate. Mix it with an oil and shake it up. You see him separate. See him separate. <laughs> CO2 made in oxidation. Inside you. Carboxylation. So divine when it combines up with the H2O's. Bonding together makes bicarbonates. He's the pH woes. <laughs> we should do this. <laughs> A carbonate can conjugate and take protons out, storing a balance inside the blood. This there is no doubt. Thus it's so. Thanks to bicarb buffer in blood flow, you don't have to suffer. <laughs> it, 
You'd conjugate to take the protons out. Restoring a balance inside of the blood. Of this there is no doubt. Protons stowed in the bicarb buffer. Harmony. Never grow, so you do not suffer. Okay, now. Let me thank everybody involved up here, the Biocomical Choir, the OSU Symphony. Let's give them all a great big hand. And another first, they have, they, the the symphony, choir, symphony Orchestra is going to play for us exit music. So uh, we'll turn this over to them. Thank <laughs> you.